Hi everyone, this is Zohar from Princeton Makes Podcast. In October, I was the artist of the month at Princeton Makes, and I had an artist talk scheduled and I recorded this podcast with my friends. But then a war started in Israel and then Gaza, and it felt really inappropriate to release the episode and to have the artist talk. And we are in February and a war is still going on in Israel and Gaza, but we decided to release the episode now. My artist talk is going to be in February 17th at 6.30 and everybody's welcome. Another disclaimer for this episode is that I had so much fun that I took off my headphones and that was a big mistake because everything that could go wrong went wrong. We lost a mic in the middle, so the sound is not great, but I hope you'll enjoy the episode. Hi artists and art lovers. Welcome to the second season and episode two of Princeton Makes. I am Zohar, the host, but today I am hosting two more friends from Princeton Makes uh, and they're gonna host the episode because mm -hmm. guess who's the artist of the month? This month, it's me. So <laughs> I have Claude Wynn. Hi, Claude. Hi. Elizabeth Quattrano. Hello, Elizabeth. hello. And they're actually gonna do this today and talk to mm. me about my art and other other things. So unlike usually, I'm less prepared. I'm just gonna give you the hosting one. So interesting. So you have to mm. say where we are and what is this place okay. and all that. We are recording right here in the Princeton Make Studio in the art market on the comfy couches and uh, where people can come and have coffee and hang out. And we're in Princeton Makes, the co-op, where there's about 37 artists here and, I don't know, 17 that have studios? We stopped counting. We stopped counting. But there's a lot of us here and we're a nice, supportive community in the heart of Princeton. Because you didn't expect this, <laughs> I would like you to go on contract. I have a witness here. Yeah. You are not allowed to edit out any compliments that we say. Ooh. <laughs> you have to let us say nice things and leave it in. Right. Okay. Promise? And I brought you some chocolate truffles. Aww. <laughs> Can I take a piece of chocolate? Of course. Do you have some tea to dip it into? <laughs> you know me. We know your rituals. What's inside? Chocolate and more chocolate. <laughs> mm, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> so, Zohar. It is so cool to sit down with you. You've sat down with so many other artists and highlighted them and put them in the spotlight and made them feel great. And now it's our turn to do that with you. And just tell us briefly, what kind of art do you make? So uh, these days I'm making pottery and I am working with ceramics. I work with a wheel, uh, I paint, I usually make a scrofito. Yeah, scrofito is an interesting um, technique where you scratch away the surface and so you're it's a subtractive I like there's method. nothing that I like to do more I just enjoy this process so much to just reveal the image mm -hmm. on the pottery it's lovely which is sort of a combination of subtractive sculpting but also illustrating mm -hmm. so every time I come here I just like to sit when I'm not making the pot which I like to but uh, I just love to sit on my little couch I have a little couch so I feel comfortable I put a chair with tea and my tools mm -hmm. and my whatever I need. And I just sit back and do that, listening to podcasts. And it's awesome. And where do you put the chocolate? There's no chocolate until night. Okay. Except for when you, we record a podcast <laughs> that I'm a guest in. So how did you get started with ceramics? Oh, sorry, that's not true. I have a little bit of chocolate in my drawer. <laughs> don't don't tell anyone. anyone. Don't tell anyone. It's Except in my drawer. It's going out to millions. <laughs> millions, yeah. 20 people <gasps> Which know. Which drawer is hard? It's in, in the drawer of my uh, desk in okay. my studio. But don't take any chocolate. OK, so you'll, you'll be OK. You'll know. <laughs> I count them. So how did you get started with ceramics? What got um, you into it? My mom did a little bit of ceramics because she, her neighbor uh, is a ceramic artist, and so she took classes. Mm. And then one day she said, I have some pots, some things here, bowls and stuff, and maybe you want to paint on them. So I said yes, and this was years ago, and um, I came and I was visiting her in Israel, and I was painting them, and it, I was painting like little Peppa Pig and a little, <laughs> I don't know, I don't remember. Probably there was a jellyfish too, but the little things, and it came out really nice. I was using very, very thin brushes. And then she fired it, and I didn't know that the, the colors are not gonna come out the same as they look. 
So some of them were a disaster, never mind. But it was a really fun experience for me. And I had it in the back of my mind. And then when the pandemic, before the pandemic hit, I had a whole different plan. I was supposed to do a podcast about science for kids. So it was mm. called Science for Kids. I already had the logo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. <laughs> no ambiguity. And the kids were supposed to host it. Oh, sweet. Mm. So I had auditions lined up at the uh, oh. public library. I had like the room uh, booked and everything. And then pandemic hit, everything shut down. I had to cancel the auditions. And then I stayed like uh, hobbyless during a pandemic, which is terrible. So I uh, thought maybe I'll learn ceramics because it was always there. I always thought maybe I should do that. And then I took some private lessons because there were no group lessons. And I loved it. And I rented, because they didn't have classes, they could um, rent me a wheel. And I took the wheel. I was doing it in my carport for a while by myself. And then um, during the cicadas uh, season, the cicadas would bump into me and into my paws. Oh, wow. and it was a mess because it was outside. They're huge. Yeah, it was funny uh, and disgusting at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what inspired you to start making no. bugs? Yeah, she, she already had the science thing going. We didn't yeah, really so talk did that. about that, the themes of the things you're doing. Yeah, yeah. before we do that, that yeah. though, I think it would be good for the listening audience to know about your background yes. because you mentioned Israel okay. but maybe yes. we should tell everyone. Yeah. I was born in Israel. I was uh, in Israel till I was 20, no, maybe 30 almost. Mm -hmm. Then I came to New York to study uh, film directing at Columbia University. I stayed since then because I met my husband. He got a position at uh, Princeton. We moved here. Princeton the University? Yes, mm -hmm. 15 years ago. I was making films originally. What kind of films were you making? Okay, I was making uh, short films at Columbia. I also did my bachelor degree in, at Tel Aviv University. I was making short films there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, after I finished my degree, and I had this film that I made in the first year that was in the New York Film Festival. Mm -hmm. So I was a promising student. And then my thesis film was not as promising. <laughs> so I was a disappointing student. <laughs> Um, that was tough, but uh, mm -hmm. I was already pregnant, and then we moved to Princeton, mm -hmm. and I wanted to make a feature film. I really wanted to make a feature film. That was my dream for many years, and I wrote a script. The script was called, also very telling, The Professor's Wife. Why? I don't know. Maybe my <laughs> husband was a professor, and I was bored, and it was about... <laughs> It was about this woman who used to be a social worker, but she uh, stopped working because she has kids, but she really needs some meaning to her mm -hmm. life. And then she sees a kid who she thinks is abused by his uh, professor father, and she uh, decides to save him. Mm. But we don't know if he really needs saving or, or not, so, but she becomes obsessed about it because her life is kind of empty. So yeah, I wrote the whole script uh, it could be better. There is some work can be done on it. But, you know, it was a script and I really wanted to make this movie. Well, maybe someone will hear this podcast and love that idea. And, and put two million dollars on and me. Fund your and fund <laughs> Put two million dollars so. on you. Woo, <laughs> 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 rain. That sounds like the, another of dollars. movie theme. The thing is with movies, feature films specifically, you need a lot of money, like millions, a lot of people mm -hmm. to be with you on your, in your like vision and a lot of time and it just demands a lot of power you know motivation Discipline. but it's just very f vulnerable you make this one thing over five years at the least and then it can be a flop mm -hmm. and nobody can maybe no one will watch it maybe well, people will watch it and hate it maybe I won't ever make a film again or I will but it was just um, it's a lot. Do you still feel drawn to, because I know for your work, you're doing a lot of work for the, for the university and you make their films right. for their artists. So that, does that have a feeling of being art or does it have a feeling of being work? Um, it's not art. It's not my art, mm. which sometimes it's frustrating because mm. I make films about other artists. Mm. And I feel like, hey, I'm an artist too. So it's a little, it can be frustrating. But now that I have this, 
I live in peace with it because <laughs> I have my corner of art making yeah. and I can do my, my work. I, I like the work be because uh, it's very interesting and I meet a lot of artists mm -hmm. and a lot of artworks. I like that. It seems like your position there is more like the role of a graphic designer where you give someone else's message. You design someone else's message yes. and communicate what they need you to communicate. Yes. I do it in my style, which yes. I'm fine with. So, yeah. so But it's I, so important like that you have your own creative outlet because I think to be a frustrated artist around yeah. other artists can be really, really tough for anybody. Right. So the ceramics becomes your outlet for mm -hmm. your, art, your artist. Yeah. Also, most people, uh, Ceramics takes patience. You have to wait for it to dry, and then you have to bisque fire it, and then you glaze it, and then you have to, and then it might break halfway. But whatever, it takes a lot of patience. But compared to what you just described for a feature film, it's a pretty fast turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> that you have tangible objects. Yeah, exactly, and see. I have like um, I make maybe every firing I make like thirty pieces in a month and a half. This is more or less what happened. Mm -hmm. how, how it happens. So relatively, like I, I make this little uh, ball and I either like it or I don't like it. Other people maybe like it or they hate it or maybe it breaks or maybe it's great, but it's, it's not, it doesn't take this toll on my financials and my, all my friends and the people I know and all my time and all my um, soul. So, you know, it's much smaller than, than the fe feature films. But you were mm -hmm. talking about the vulnerability before about investing so much and then the potential for it to not succeed and right. how much that would be crushing. You didn't say crushing, but I got that <laughs> impression. Oh, yeah. But this somehow is more free, freeing for yeah. you. Yeah. And do you feel that attachment to how people are, I mean, we all cope with this as artists, how people respond to your work? You know, when I just got here, I just started, I was really a fresh Potter. I was like one year into it and my things were like, you know, they were very fresh and I somehow I didn't care. I was like, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I think maybe it's the age too. <laughs> I was just like, eh, I don't, whatever, they can think whatever they want. I'm going to fake it till I make it and I'm going to put enough time and effort into it mm -hmm. so something nice will come out of it. You well, know, you eventually. clearly, you clearly from the outside seem to enjoy the process. I do. And so that's a wonderful way to be a maker because you don't get hamstrung by what p other people think. Mm -hmm. But I've, Claude and I were chatting before we came here and, and if I can say this on your behalf, we're both impressed by how you just continue to iterate and you keep working. And your, your um, craft has improved, your Pots are delightful. Your illustrations have always been nice, and now your pots are matching that. And yeah, they just get better and better. Yeah. because you make so much. Mm -hmm. like right. You just you work so hard. Mm -hmm. You're one of the hardest workers that I've yeah. seen here. And you, you, and you know, the podcast. You participate in so many of the event planning. The community things. You have such a strong feeling of what needs to happen to mm -hmm. grow this place. You care so much about it, and that means a lot to me personally. And yeah. I know to every. Like, Everyone. Yeah, you're. So this is the part that I shouldn't cut. Yeah, out. you don't get to cut this out. You're a huge <laughs> asset to this co-op. Yeah, it's just kind of cool to watch you make and make and make and improve and improve and improve. Yeah. And um, that is, that's inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I also, um, ever since I met you, which was probably over a year ago now, uh, because I'm also a ceramic artist, so we've had many conversations that yes. don't need to be in this podcast, but. Um, I keep thinking about how film, being a filmmaker, affects your ceramics. And also, you're a podcast maker. I mean, you're working with audio, you work with film and images in, in clips, and now you're working in moments of pottery. I've been chewing on what, what are the relationships there. I, I don't know, I don't have an answer, but I think it's really interesting how you go between them the same way you go between English and, and Hebrew. Mm. You just shift and and shrug like you don't, it doesn't seem like you think it's a big deal. And I'm watching going, that's a big deal. <laughs> do, you, do you sense a connection? Like when you're making your pots, do you think about film? Do you have any? I don't actually. Right. It's so different. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like bugs. My films are always, <sighs> they're not about bugs. I made my, one film about bugs. Oh. <laughs> It That's was called. Is it a horror film? The bugs, <laughs> the bugs collection. I was very young. The bugs collection of my friend Maya, 
and it was she was studying uh, I don't know how it's called Ent entomology. Yes, mm -hmm. at, in Israel, and I was following her for her trip to collect bugs, and I was filming her collecting the bugs and pinning them. Pinning them. Yeah, that, that was fun for me. But I think I'm drawn to um, like simple truth. Mm. You you know? Yeah. Yeah, I really don't like kitsch. Is that a word? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. tacky things. My film in the uh, when I was in. The Columbia University, the one that was in the festival, is about a guy that wants to jump off a cliff for fun into the water, and he's really, really scared. And I think just this close-up to his face when he's really scared of this thing, it just, I don't know why, but <laughs> it makes me think about Your my bugs, bugs, on, bugs, on, bugs a mug. on a mug. Oh, that, I like <laughs> my that. My bugs on a mug. His face close-up, the fear in it, the, sp yeah. the, the relatable emotion that we all have the reality fear mm -hmm. and here it is on a close mark. up yes that maybe you didn't say the word authentic but the authenticity of the truth that of what we're looking at some people are afraid of some people look with curiosity like you do at the bugs i think there's something about working with clay that you you can't pretend you have to be really present and the clay picks up fingerprints Mm -hmm. breath it saves it it freezes it in a moment and I wonder if that's part of an unconscious why, reason why you like working with clay I don't I don't know exactly mine but yeah maybe I don't know. when you talked about Scarcito, you're yeah. you're scraping out a shape and you're getting to something you know mm -hmm. that's true right. and in this case it's that the bugs are beautiful mm -hmm. yeah. we are saying they're many of us in, in the world, they're, they're gross, they're scary, they're icky, they're squish it, kill it. And you're like, they're beautiful. And you're showing us by carving away something from, you know, plain surface. And I think that, I don't know, it reminded me of what you said about the face of the person in fear. You know, it's, it's getting closer to something. Mm -hmm. Looking up close at something. And being anyway. curious rather than yeah. afraid. I, I like that. Right. Yeah, and my, my other film is... Um, called Zula Move. It's about Israeli people after the army, they come to Manhattan. They work in a moving company. There are many of those, or at least they used to be. They're strong, they come from the army, they can mm -hmm. do everything, they feel they're gonna cup, you know, conquer Manhattan. Um, so they move stuff. And there too, it's like there's this, the guy he, who feels he's on the top of the world and he's like giving um, orders to the other people and he's in charge and, and everything and then and then in the movie, I feel like I'm, I look at him at some point when he's broken and I see the truth, like underneath all his pretending and bossing around and thinking that he's like this big shot. So I think maybe it's kind of similar in that way. So this is the yeah. film that was you, you said earlier was not successful? Not successful. So in my experience, when I think something wasn't successful, I usually learn something later on. Who decided it wasn't successful? First of all, I can see there are some nice things in it mm -hmm. that I like, but there are the story is not very good. But anyway, Columbia University, the film yes. program, they have every year a DVD that is a combination of like, I don't remember how many, it's eight films that are great in their opinion. And then they take these the directors to LA to meet agents and producers. Mm. I was not on that oh. DVD. It was very painful. I got some money to make this film. I didn't have to spend my own money, but so many people, and I made shirts to everyone. Everyone, it was a really happy production. People were really happy and loved being on this mm. set, and I was in, really enjoying. And I remember one night after shooting, I was already with Uri, and I took a shower, and I told him, you know what? I'm enjoying this so much. This is such a magic happening on the set. If this film doesn't succeed, I'm gonna quit filmmaking. <laughs> and I didn't, because I wrote a script after it, because right. it's hard to quit filmmaking. Yeah. You always say that you quit, but you don't quit, until you start pottery. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, was, uh, it felt like that. If this magic is not gonna you know, present itself to the amazing thing that it feels that it should be, then something's not working in this for me. Right. Well, in a way, the making a pot is a microcosm of this because 
you didn't you love the process and you didn't care whether it sells or anybody likes it. But right. somehow with the film, you did care. Oh, because also somehow with the film, you make one in five years, like we said before. Right. So many people are involved, so much money, so much time. So you can't not care about it. Yeah, so if it fails, it's how not a little pot. It's, no. it's this whole um, production. How, how long was that? Did that take? Uh, it was a short, yeah. so it was 10 minutes only. Uh, it took um, uh, some months and ten, at least like $15,000 yeah. and like at least 20 people were involved. Yeah. And definitely my heart. Yeah. So mm. <laughs> Big enough to, to cause. It was a lot. And, when, and after I finished Colombia, I didn't want to make short films anymore. I didn't want people to work for me for no pay. Yeah. I wanted to pay people that, that, you know, because yeah. I have the vision, it doesn't mean that they have to, you know, volunteer. Sure. So I really wanted money and I wanted um, to do it, but it didn't work out. It's, it's ending up that we're talking more about my filmmaking career than my pottery career. Well, we can shift back. No, I, okay. I think it's, um, it's part of your, part of your background. I was just going to say, it sounds like you're not done with filmmaking uh. at all. <laughs> I like I didn't know that about you. I didn't know if you were going more into pottery making, but now I sense that they're they're both on two tracks. They're, they're yeah, I don't you know. haven't stopped. I don't know. Well, and the podcasts are another podcast production. is fun yeah. because first of all, it's fun to talk with people, mm -hmm. but also I'm so used to making to filming stuff. When you film stuff, you have to worry about the actors, about the scenery, about the cameras, about the focus, and so yeah. here. I only care about sound. Right. So I can even listen and be engaged in the conversation. I don't e I'm not even wearing my headphones. <laughs> and I hope it's okay, because we'll be sad, because this is a fun conversation. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I don't have to worry about all these things, and I can be engaged in the conversation. Right. I'm well. curious about sound mm -hmm. and ceramics, because I notice when you throw pots, you <laughs> always have your earphones in. Do you listen to music? What Podcast. do you listen to? Podcasts. Podcasts. I love podcasts. I remember when I was a kid and I would drive in my mom's car and she would listen to Rashid Bet <laughs> and Razi Barkay. I hated it so Wait, what are those? Help us. It just talk, talk. Talk. You turn into your mother. You, I'm totally turning into my mother. What's your podcast of choice? <laughs> uh, I listen to the daily every day. That's my obsession uh -huh. and keeps me like I know what's going on more or less. Yep. If something's going on, it's not on the daily. I don't know that it happened <laughs> and it just didn't happen. Uh, and I listen to some Israeli podcasts. Sometimes I listen to music and and then I'm, I love listening to music mm. when I uh, make pots because it, it's very different. Mm -hmm. But I need to listen to my podcasts first. How did you get to Prince and Make? Actually, my friend sent me this, uh, this uh, poster that was on the, on the window here. And I walked around and I came in one day. It was like you were open for less than a month, I think. And I was talking to Ardi and I was with Aya, my daughter. And I submitted my work and I got in and I was very happy and excited. And I love Princeton Makes. I, it's so funny that I was in a whole different world of filmmakers. I started making pottery and then in a year I fell into this community of artists, which is very different from anyone I was friends with before and it was really great. I made some friends and everybody's so nice and supportive and I really love being part of this community and spending time here. So cool. Yes. Well, is it time to do the fast fire it's time. thing? This is uh, your favorite segment but also <laughs> listeners as well. Ask the artist. So we're going to ask you questions um, that you ask all the artists in your podcast and you need to provide us with one to two words and up to a sentence. To answer. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's go. 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 Who is your favorite artist of all time? I think I like Modigliani. Ooh, I like him too. And um, Giacometti. What is your favorite material? This is something we didn't talk about. Oh, which? My love for long things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I feel the same way. Anyway, what is your favorite material to create with? Clay. What is the space that you feel most creative in? My studio. What is your worst artistic nightmare? <sighs> This is my nightmare in general, to lose my brain, like dementia and all those. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, that's beyond artistic nightmare. I'm thinking a pot breaks. <laughs> Last question. One word that describes how you feel when you create. Satisfied. Ooh. Oh. Okay, before we wrap up, where can people find your work? People can find my work at Princeton Makes, at Princeton Shopping Center. We're open from Thursday to Sunday. 10 to 6. 
Yeah, I'm on Instagram at Zohar Lavi Hassan, Facebook, and I don't post much, only when I get things in the kiln and out of the kiln. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today and giving us a window into the world of Zohar. Are so you kidding? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing this with me. This was so fun and I am so happy that, that you said let's do it all together. RD is our graphic designer and our theme music is by Renata Pugh. I'm Elizabeth Quatrano. And I'm Claude Wynn. And we are hosting today on behalf of Zohar. If you have any questions or comments, please email to our new email address, princetonmakespodcast at gmail.com. Also, let us know if you would like to be added to our mailing list. Rate and share this podcast so that it can reach others and maybe inspire them to create. Until next time, be creative and kind. Be like Zohar. Yes. <laughs> it's a wrap. Woo!